please enjoy your dinner. We're going to start our award ceremony now. So we can just be a little quiet, but enjoy your dinner, please. So uh, I wanted to thank a few more institutions to, that have helped us so much in producing and organizing the World Stem Cell Summit. One of the unique things about creating the summit is that when we started 11 years ago, we realized a small nonprofit organization that no one knew much about couldn't do it on our own. So we were smart enough to team up with some really wonderful institutions. We've partnered with Baylor College of Medicine, Johns Hopkins Medicine, Harvard uh, Stem Cell Institute, all these institutions I probably couldn't have gotten into. Uh, but that's all right. They partnered with me, which is even better. Uh, of course, I went to the Harvard of the South, which is uh, the University of Miami, uh, the uh, undergraduate in law school, I might add. Uh, this year, we've had some wonderful institutions that have teamed up with us and provided leadership for this meeting. And I want to give them some recognition now. Um, the first, of course, is the Georgia Center for Regenerative Engineering and Medicine, comprised of Emory Medicine, uh, University of Georgia, and Georgia Tech, as our host institution. Also, the Mayo Clinic, that I think this is the fourth year they've joined us as co-organizers of this meeting, and that's Dr. Andre Terzik. I should say I want to thank our co-chairs from REM as well, Bob Neerum, Jana Temenoff, Ned Waller, Edmund Ned Waller, and Stephen Stice that have helped us so much in organizing this meeting, and I want to thank them, thank them all. Also joining us this year is BioBridge Global for the second year in a row, and that's led by Linda Myers. And thank BioBridge Global, which is the, the mammoth blood and tissue bank and has spun off Qualtex and, uh, and GenCure and is uh, devoted to advancing regenerative medicine. Uh, in addition, uh, we uh, acknowledge uh, our friends from Kyoto University's Institute of Integrated Cell Material Sciences, which I believe for the third or fourth year has joined us as co-organizer, and our esteemed colleague, Dr. Norio, Professor Dr. Norio Nagasushi, who has helped us so much. Thank you, Norio. Norio is here. You please give Norio a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, we have a giant delegation of over 45 delegates from Japan, and we're very honored uh, to host them here. Also, the Wake Forest Institute of uh, Regenerative Medicine, uh, led by uh, our colleague and our, the founder of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation, Dr. Anthony Atala, Tony Atala, and his wonderful staff of volunteers that have also volunteers for the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and GPI, including Dr. Julie Allison, Dr. Uh, Hunsberger, and also Joan Shank. Uh, we thank you all for your support. And finally, the New York Stem Cell S Foundation and Susan Solomon. Without these institutions, we could have not produced this summit. So let's please give them a round of applause. And believe me, least but not least, I want to make sure I give a shout out to my beloved wife of 43 years, Cheryl Siegel, that's put up with this Michigas for so long. Cheryl. Thank you, dear. You, you, you have no idea. Even a prophet takes out garbage in his own house, I assure you. <laughs> so we're going to move to this uh, very important awards uh, ceremony. One of the great benefits of the merger of Genetics Policy Institute and the Regenerative Medicine Foundation is a relationship with AlphaMed Press, because the official journal partner of a tremendous, highly ranked, um, high impact journal, Stem Cells Translational Medicine, uh, is the uh, official journal partner of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation. And the merged organization has the benefit of that. So of, obviously, it even adds more um, science gravitas to the work that we do, besides our wonderful science advisory board that has been so tremendous and really brought me, the sci leading scientist brought me into the field as an advocate. So that AlphaMed Press uh, is founded by Ann Murphy. 
and who is the recipient of our Education Award this year. The uh, editor, the senior editor of Stem Cells Translational Medicine is Dr. Anthony Atala. And I might add that our own journal, the Genetics Policy Institute Journal, World Stem Cell Report, that's in your conference bag, uh, a, a peer-reviewed peer journal uh, that we created se uh, several years ago when we uh, started the institute. Uh, believe me, my 10th grade biology teacher would be surprised that I founded this journal. Uh, uh, is actually published this year as a supplement to stem cell translational medicine. So the senior editor is Anthony Atal. I'm going to ask Tony to come up and introduce our Education Award winner, uh, Ann Murphy. Thank you, Bernie. First of all, just to really thank Bernie for all the work he has done for this meeting and uh, also for the merger of the uh, foundation, the Regenerative Medicine Foundation and GPI. What a wonderful partnership, and uh, I know that Bernie has a dedication and heart, as we all know, to keep this field moving forward with all the dedication he has uh, uh, given to this cause to date. So also to his wife, Cheryl, and uh, recognize his wife, Cheryl, and also Alan Fernandez. Thank you all for all you do. And I would like to uh, actually just say a couple of words about Anne Murphy. She, as as uh, Bernie said, she is the publisher and managing editor of uh, Stem Cells Translational Medicine. Uh, but she's also the editor uh, and the managing editor and publisher for two other journals, uh, Stem Cells, the journal Stem Cells, which was in fact the very first journal in the field 33 years ago. So imagine the vision that the Murphys had and Anne had to actually really be a pioneer in the field and establish this pioneering journal. The other journal, as uh, Bernie said, is uh, Stem Cell Translational Medicine, which is the official journal of the foundation and GPI. And uh, the other journal is The Oncologist, which started 20 years ago and uh, was very, uh, a leading journal for oncologists, uh, who remains a leading journal today, and also they started the uh, Society for Clinical Translational Oncology, which serves patients uh, in terms of new discoveries. So she's been an amazing force for the field, as Bernie mentioned. I just want to say a couple of interesting things about Anne. Did you know she holds a doctorate of philosophy with distinction from New York University in the area of literature? Uh, she also serves on the board of visitors of the UNC Leinberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. And she's a published authority on the Irish literary renaissance and the biographer of the Irish playwright and poet, Mr. Colum. She's a mother of five, a grandmother of ten, and she makes her home with her wonderful husband, Marty Murphy. And could you please come up and receive this award? first, and then you can say a few words. Well, first of all, congratulations, Bernie and Tony, on the wonderful merger. It's an honor, it's an honor for me to accept this award on behalf of all those who've made stem cells and stem cells translational medicine possible every single month. We are very grateful to our global editorial board members who serve as lead reviewers, aligning the journals with the field and, and the important discoveries. We're very grateful to our reviewers who volunteer their time and who 
with their, with their combined experience as a community of professionals ensure that these peer-reviewed studies are important to the field. We're very grateful to our editorial and production staff uh, and our marketing folks. Sharon is with us tonight and they form a, fan a fantastic team and they are the ones who coordinate everything behind the scenes somehow very magically. And very importantly, it's because of our editors-in-chief, Jan Nolta and Tony Atala, with their tireless efforts, somehow managed to do it all. I don't know, it's just amazing with their ever-growing responsibilities, but they do a fantastic job. And they see that the highest quality, that only the highest quality of stem cell research is published. So I want to tell you just a little bit about um, stem cells. Uh, Dr. Tala started that, um, introduced it. So we, we founded it in uh, 1981. And it's interesting because uh, there, there were actually four, four founding editors. So there was Don Metcalf from Australia, Fumimara Takaku from Japan, Laszlo Lido from the UK, and then my husband, uh, Marty Murphy. And they were all doing cell cloning at the time, and there was just no place for them to publish. And they were faxing their results uh, back and forth. So they, they worked with Carger to, uh, Carger to start this, this journal, to publish this journal, Stem Cells. And it was a bi-monthly journal. But by the second year, bi-monthly got to be four months, six months, nine months. And so they, along with the inaugural uh, editorial board said, well, this really defeats the purpose. So they all resigned. And they said, well, let's start our own journal. That can't be that hard. And so they recruited me as their volunteer. So uh, there was one little disappointment, and that is that they couldn't keep the word stem cells because um, Carger wanted $25,000 a word, and we didn't have $50,000. So uh, it was Don Metcalf who said, well, okay, let's just use the subtitle, the International Journal of Cell Cloning. So that's what we did. And for 10 years, uh, it was the International Journal of Cell Cloning until stem cells reverted back to um, the public domain. And we have been taking very good care of those two words ever since. So over the course of, um, of the 33, Oh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that would be easier. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I'm really happy to tell you that uh, our very own Jan Nolta was appointed as editor-in-chief uh, during Stem Cell's auspicious 30th year. And we celebrated this with a, with a landmark uh, January issue. So over the course of, of the 33 years of stem cells, uh, we've published 3,576 uh, original articles and concise reviews, and keep in mind that we started this bi-monthly before we became monthly. In addition to these editorials, commentaries, and many supplements that have helped to scaffold the learning and provide more venues uh, to discuss these uh, stem cell research uh, investigations. So as the field kept rap rapidly developing, we noted that there was yet uh, a demand for another important journal, a journal that was focused on translational aspects of stem cell research. So we gave, we gave this name while we were talking about it. We gave this, this journal the code name Alpha. In 2011, to bridge this gap between bench-anchored science and clinical investigations, stem cells translational medicine was launched with the generous seed grant from CIRM, and we are forever grateful to our friends and colleagues at CIRM who made this possible. We were and are honored to have Tony Atala as our founding editor-in-chief. Together, we embarked on our common mission dedicated to make these issues a priority, to foster the acceleration of the entire field by allowing knowledge to be aggregated and shared more readily. So in less than, in less than four years, um, since that inaugural issue in January of 2012, 
uh, SCTM as we call, as we, uh, its abbreviation. So SCTM has achieved significant milestones as a monthly peer-reviewed journal. So we were accepted during that first year by Medline. We received our first impact factor in 2014, and in 2015 we saw a 60% increase in that impact factor. Thus far, we have published 571 original articles and uh, concise reviews. So this journal has quickly emerged as a leading resource in a very competitive field. We are proud, as uh, Tony and Bernie said, to be the official journal partner of the Regenerative Medicine Foundation. We also began the uh, stem cells portal as a way to aggregate the content between these two uh, journals. And we, are, we have the help of a wonderful group of dedicated editors on both sides of the Atlantic. And we're, we're pleased with what we have done there in terms of uh, stem cell buzz, a journal club. Uh, we have international news and clinical trials. And we next plan to, to create an advocacy section. And we are really excited about being able to do that in uh, 2016. So as Thomas Edison remarked, um, I've not failed. I have just found 10,000 things that didn't work. So <laughs> one, one, of the, one of the things that, that uh, we, we are really proud of is that we, uh, we, we are publishing first in human case studies, and we are also encouraging uh, the publication of negative trials because we believe that this is data that really does need to be shared. We are very proud to encourage uh, the development of the Young Investigator Award. So this year, uh, for the first time, and this thanks, thanks to you, Bernie, we are able to uh, give the uh, awards to our Young Investigator Award of Stem Cells and our Young Investigator Award of Stem Cells Translational Medicine. So we are, we are very proud to do this, to present these awards to Dr. Camille uh, Kronk for Stem Cells and Dr. Dustin uh, Wachman for Stem Cells Translational Medicine. So this will be, these will be. <laughs> So we're really thrilled about this. So they're going to present their work on uh, Saturday afternoon. So I, I would like to, uh, to end on a note of gratitude to everyone. This is a wonderful organization. Bernie, you've done a fantastic job. And this is really, this is really my honor and um, on behalf of all of those who, who have made uh, this possible. And I especially want to thank my husband, Marty, my life partner of 50 years, five children, and 10 grandchildren. Thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you so thank much. You want to pick it up after the yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ann, and thank you for the remarks. Our next uh, honor is the Advocacy Award, one of our Advocacy Awards. And we're going to honor tonight Tori Williams and as an individual advocate in her organization, the Alabama Institute of Medicine. Tori was born and raised in the small town of Milry, Milry Alabama, proud mother of four. She co-founded with Roman Reed, Don's son, and also a, a, one of our uh, advocacy honorees in past year, the, non, the nonprofit Alabama Institute of Regenerative Medicine, of uh, Medicine. She played a leadership role in the passage of the T.J. Atchison Spinal Cord Injury Act, also known as T.J.'s Law, which provided over $800,000 in funding for spinal cord injury in Alabama. Even while battling PKD, Tory found time and strength to author the compelling book, Inevitable Collision, the inspiring story that brought stem cell research to conservative America, published by our colleagues at Mary Ann Liebert uh, Press. Let me invite Tory up to receive an advocacy award.
Good evening, everyone, and um, thank you, Bernie and Alan, and um, for all of you being here tonight for this special event. Five years ago, a family friend, T.J. Atchison, was involved in a tragic car accident which left him paralyzed from the waist down. After T.J. was admitted to the Shepherd Center in Atlanta here, they realized that he was the perfect match and candidate for a groundbreaking clinical trial testing the safety of human embryonic stem cells. Now this was the first of its kind, um, the phase one clinical trial that was sponsored in part by Roman Reed's foundation and also our allies at Serum. Soon after TJ was injected with over two million embryonic stem cells, um, he's a close family friend. I had visited him at the Shepherd Center and he was being approached by other journalists and authors to chronicle his story of not only recovering from this devastating um, injury, but also to document and chronicle his life after the injury. And so he asked if I would champion the cause and uh, serve as the author of his story. Now, I admit that taking on the authorship and voice of this story uh, came with many challenges. Because of my personal experiences dealing with the disease, my sister's battled cancer throughout her entire life, and um, soon after we published our story, uh, she was diagnosed again with breast cancer. But I also was diagnosed in 2010 with polycystic kidney disease. It's a hereditary disease that's um, typically passed down from one of your parents. And my mom, Glenda, is here tonight, and it, it came from her side of the family. So we've had several family members that have battled PKD. I'm also the, the mother of four young children. And when you're diagnosed with PKD, you uh, typically can pass on the disease you know, to your children. So they have a 50% chance each of inheriting this disease. Um, in order to document TJ's story accurately, I knew that I had to reach beyond the borders of Alabama. I had to go and, and meet with the researchers and the funding mechanism behind this important clinical trial. Um, my degree is in elementary education. I'm not a researcher, but the passion and determination has come from our family uh, and our friends and other loved ones who are affected with disease. So I championed the cause. I, I got out there. I flew to California and um, you know met with the researchers there. Uh, I've been lucky in life before, um, but one of the luckiest moments I think in my life was when I met Roman Reed. And after learning about TJ's uh, clinical trial and who funded the clinical trial, I started using social media. It's a great tool for us to use to connect with each other and then also to other organizations that are allies in this fight for cure. And so I was on Twitter one night uh, typing in just random searches of, you know, the greatest stem cell advocate. And the first one that popped up was Roman Reed. And so many of you here tonight know Roman personally. Uh, you know the care and determination that this man has. Uh, Roman was paralyzed, I believe, in 1994, and he has raised hundreds of millions of dollars in California. So that night, I pressed send on my inbox, and I thought, he'll never reply to me. I'm here in, you know, small town Alabama, and it was within moments that I heard the ding, and I couldn't get to my computer fast enough when I opened my inbox and saw that Roman not only responded, but he also offered to help connect me with um, the researcher who was behind the protocol that TJ had participated in. So Dr. Hans Kierstead is one of the most renowned stem cell researchers uh, out there. He is the first stem cell researcher to be funded by the FDA. And so it was just incredible to really connect not only with Roman, but now also have the opportunity to interview Dr. Kierstead. And so through our efforts, we were able to uh, document the research, you know, the efforts of all these people for decades uh, that I knew then this story has taken it, you know, it's, we need to take it to another level. Um, TJ and I started brainstorming and thinking about ways that we could improve the biotech community here in Alabama. And so through the network and relationships that Roman and I had built over our five-year uh, friendship and partnership, 
we were blessed to be able to pass a law in Alabama to fund stem cell research. We had bipartisan support uh, through our Alabama legislature, which funded over $800,000 to the University of Alabama at Birmingham at UAB. Now this particular program, the initiative was strictly for spinal cord injury. I was recruited to serve as the program coordinator for this initiative. And it was during that time at UAB that I began meeting with different department chairs and you know they were nearly begging, Tori, what can your group, what can your network, your resources do to help us raise money for our target application, maybe it's cardiovascular or oncology or diabetes or organ failure. And so the light bulb moment went off that I have been placed in this time of life with unfortunate circumstances, but to seize the opportunity that we are here for a reason and we need to do something more. And so that's when Roman and I agreed to uh, start a program in Alabama. We, we pinned it and named it the Alabama Institute of Medicine, AIM, AIM for Cures. And a slogan that we picked up early on was, you know, we want to have coast to coast for cures. So I believe it was Roman who introduced me to um, the New York Stem Cell Foundation. And I emailed the organization. I flew to New York and met with their representatives there who then connected me to Bernie. And, you know, connecting the dots, uh, it was after meeting Bernie and learning about the World Stem Cell Summit that I knew for us to really launch a program in Alabama, I needed to know what the community was about. And so a team of us from Alabama, several board members and investors, potential investors, uh, decided to go to the World Stem Cell Summit in 2013. And we flew there in San Diego and it was just a great, you know, experience and opportunity. Um, one of the participants that traveled with us, uh, Chris Drummond, he he is from a very well-respected family in Birmingham, Alabama, and they've been extremely successful in the coal industry. And so Chris traveled with us, met Bernie, met many of the honorees that evening, and um, it was after that moment Chris said, you know, we have the resources in Alabama, we've got great researchers there and uh, institutions, but we lack funding. I mean, all of you here can agree there's a lack for funding for stem cell research. So Chris, at 28 years old, we flew back to Birmingham, had a few coffee shop meetings and kind of brainstormed of ways we could build the program in Alabama. And it was a week later that we received a $1 million donation from Chris Drummond. And had it not been for the World Stem Cell Summit in San Diego and the opportunity to meet with groups, you know, like you guys here, other advocates that are here that are wondering how can we launch a program like this in our state, it's by coming to these types of conferences and meeting with you know, your colleagues and peers and then going back into your areas and conveying that message to your constituents there. And so I've gotten away from my speech a little bit, but not only did we um, receive the funding for AIM, we had, to, we had to build the program and we didn't want to just uh, receive this money and not be able to efficiently use it. Um, and so we did a call for applications through our program. We sent out a statewide public release and this was in 2000, let's see, 2014. We received eight applications. Now that's huge for us in Alabama because it identified and, and we recognize that there is a presence of researchers here doing stem cell research. Out of those eight applications, we narrowed down with the help of Dr. Jane Lepowski from Asterius Biotherapeutics. She serves as our scientific review chairperson. And through a double blind peer review um, uh, analysis of those applications, we narrowed it down to three projects to fund. So in the very first year of our funding, we funded nearly $900,000 to those three researchers. One is for sickle cell anemia at UAB, which 5% of our population suffers from sickle cell anemia. This project particularly has the potential to enter into clinical trial within the next few years, so we're extremely excited about that. The second project is for cardiovascular disease, and the third project is identifying a certain gene expression, the PODXL gene. And so this year, for 2015, we have 
um, recognized two other projects to fund. One is at Auburn University and the other is at the University of South Alabama, the Mitchell Cancer Institute. So we were amazed this year at the ripple effect we've already created in Alabama where this year we had 12 applications to come in. They were from multiple um, institutions from across the state. So AIM is making a tremendous difference. We're raising awareness and funding for stem cell research. And had it not been for Bernie and this group here, um, you know, it would not have been possible. So we are extremely appreciative. And thank you for honoring us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I'll keep you okay, that's great. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. That's yours. Thank you, thank you, Tori. That was uh, beautiful. And uh, a million dollar gift came from the World Stem Cell Summit. Let's remember that. I'll be waiting here afterwards, you know, <laughs> in case anyone has any great ideas, all right? You know, we really, really have done some wonderful things here. But I won't give you that speech now. Uh, in fact, I won't give it to you tonight, don't worry. Uh, our next honoree uh, uh, is our dear friend, member of the Science Advisory Board of the Genetics Policy Institute. Uh, I like to say, a friend to all, she speaks on more panels than any other individual, a scientist that is tied into the advocacy community like no other, and that of course is my friend Jean Loring, professor and founding director of the Center for Regenerative Medicine at the Scripps Research Institute. Uh, it says in this program that she's bold and an outspoken advocate, educator, and gifted scientist. She informs me, Pete, a member of our board, that she does support IP, so you can feel relaxed about that. She has several patents in her own name, because we were just concerned about that, but she is a, a free market person all the way. And so great supporter and champion of science. Let me just introduce my friend, Jean Loring, a recipient of our Advocacy Award. This is a real thrill for me. Um, this, um, this award represents um, the confidence of my colleagues, and there's nothing better than that. Um, I'm going to be very brief. Um, I wanted to point out that several of the speakers in this conference have pointed out that it takes a village to develop a stem cell therapy. And I, I agree with that, and I want to add that that village can't just be any village. It has to be a village that contains scientists, researchers, clinicians, patients, and patient advocates. And only by working together can this village be successful. <clears throat> So people say that patients don't understand science, and the reason for that is it's our fault because we're not communicating with the right language. Um, science is really exciting, and if you communicate it with the enthusiasm that you feel, then people will want to participate. They'll want to show up. They want to know what you're doing. And stem cells are especially exciting. So. Stem cell science is not very difficult to understand. Um, if you want an explanation of, of stem cells, you could ask Jennifer Robb, who's one of our patients in our Parkinson's program. Um, she can tell you all about uh, her iPS cells that we're turning into dopamine neurons that we plan to transplant back to her. You could also ask Sherry Gould, who is the inspiring, um, the inspiring f uh, leader of our funding organization called the Stem Cell Summit. Um, Sherry is a uh, nurse practitioner, and she's the person who convinced me to get involved in this in the first place. So um, I just want to say that including patients in our research is not difficult. 
In fact, our scientists are the real winners in this, kind, this partnership because they feel like the work that they're doing is going to lead to something important at the end of the day. So I want to accept this award um, on behalf of the thousands of Parkinson's disease patients who are supporting our work. Um, and I also want to make sure that I give credit to Andres Ratlial, who is leading our program on Parkinson's disease. Um, I think we have a great future in stem cell development. Thank you. I told you not to sit down. Thank you, Jean. Uh, I'm verklempt. The, um, let's see if I can follow the script for once in my life. Uh, one year I forgot to introduce the introducer and I had the introduction after I had already given the award. I'm not gonna do that this year because the, the introducer of Bob Neerum is a very important individual. And, uh, and ver but uh, let me just tell you about Bob Neerum First of all, we would not have had this World Stem Cell Summit in Atlanta if it weren't for Dr. Neerum, whose brilliant leadership, emeritus leadership, and almost an icon of research in bioengineering, uh, was gracious enough to uh, give me a tour of the Petit Institute and showed me the showcase uh, uh, dedicated to, to uh, Parker Petit and, the, and uh, in the memory of Parker Petit. And, uh, I was so moved and so impressed at the same time, really impressed with the infrastructure of Georgia Tech that really was astonishing because I've been at many, many universities around the world and seen research centers, but the sheer vastness of the Georgia Tech infrastructure was absolutely amazing and I knew it was a wonderful uh, partner. None of this can really happen without the generosity of philanthropists and, uh, and people that are true believers and in in dedicated to science. And uh, uh, Pete Petit, the chairman of Medmedics, is such a generous soul that provided the funding to build one of the great bioengineering centers in the world. So I want to have our introducer of our great Bob Neerum, who is going to receive our leadership award, uh, award uh, Pete Petit, if you would join us, please. Start by thanking Bernie. I haven't known him for perhaps 24 hours, but there's an old adage that I was introduced to decades ago, and it goes like this. Leadership is a lot like pornography. It's hard to describe, but you know it when you see it. I thought that might strike a chord. <laughs> That's probably a good thing. <laughs> Bernie, I sincerely appreciate you asking me to introduce Dr. Bob Neurum. It's my distinct honor and a pleasure to do so. I've known Bob in Maryland for almost 30 years and I can assure you that my life has been enriched by their friendship. First, I'll comment on Bob Neerum's achievements that I am personally familiar with. They relate to his involvement at Georgia Tech and Emory University Medical School. I first met Bob in 1986 when he was going through an interview for Georgia Tech's second distinguished professorial chair. In this case, it was a chair for engineering and medicine and I'd been asked to endow this chair by Dr. Joseph Pettit, the president of Georgia Tech at the time. In so doing, I had asked if I could at least interview the three candidates, which I know was unusual, but I asked anyway. I intended to keep my opinions to myself. However, after interviewing Bob, I did become quite vocal about his leadership qualities. Fortunately, the search committee also recognized Bob le Bob's leadership qualities, and they certainly graded him extremely high on his academic achievements. And they offered him the position. 
So Bob joins Georgia, joined Georgia Tech in 1987. From that point forward, it's been a success that has come rapidly and is quite inspiring for those of you that know about it. After Bob arrived, I encouraged the presidents of Georgia Tech and, and Emory, Joe Pettit and Jim Laney, to support the two universities in their efforts to, to come together on biotechnology. <coughs> Excuse me. However, I can assure you that it was Bob Neurum who led this vision into reality. Bob's unselfish leadership and that of certain Emory clinicians formalized a relationship and has grown to be an outstanding example of how a private university and a public university can cooperate in an area of science and medicine. In 2005, or actually a little before that, Bob was instrumental in developing the vision and the founding of the Institute for Bioengineering and Bioscience at Georgia Tech. That became the first multidisciplinary institute at Georgia Tech. The success of the institute has become a model for others to admire and emulate not only at Georgia Tech, but across the country. In order to be certain that you clearly understand why Bob Neurum is receiving this leadership award tonight, let me take a moment to read some of the more recent achievements in the tissue engineering and regenerative medicine field of Bob Neurum. In 2012, he became an international fellow of the Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine International Society. In 2013, he received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Tissue Engineering and Regenerative Medicine International Society. In 2014, he received the ECI Award for Scale Up and Manufacturing of Cell-Based Therapies. Some of his early achievements include, he was the president of the Tissue Engineering International Society, which became Thermos from 2002 to 2004. He was a founding president and is a fellow of the American Institute for Medical and Biological Engineering, AMBI. He served on the advisory boards of a number of companies and from 2000 to 2003, he was a member of the FDA Scientific Board. From 2003 to 2006, he was a part-time senior advisor in the National Institute for Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering at the National Institute of Health. In 1988, he was elected to the National Academy of Engineering, and in 1992 to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. Generally, when I'm asked about the successes with the Georgia Tech and Emory biotechnology endeavors, I always use a comment that I believe was first routinely used by President Harry S. Truman. That is, quote, Success comes easy when you do not care who gets credit for it. That statement epitomizes Dr. Bob Neurum's leadership style, and I submit to you that philosophy is a key to Bob's leadership successes and, it's, and the organizations that were fortunate enough to have Bob Neurum involved with them. So without any further conversation, let's get Bob Neurum to the podium. Bob. Stand between us. We're going to pose for a picture. You want me to hold this for you? Well, either way. That's good. My pleasure. Okay. And everyone else has been given a hug, so I get a hug too, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've been compared to a pornographer. <laughs> well, thank you, Pete, and thank you. Bernie and all those that work with you for this honor. I'm truly deeply, uh, deeply moved. Um, whoops. Doesn't quite. There you go. Is that yours? No, <clears throat> that might be Ann Murphy's. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I'm here in many ways representing what I this morning called the uh, Georgia Mafia in Regenerative Medicine. And uh, it really centers around an organization that has, been, um, has evolved to become the Regenerative Engineering and Medicine Center involving Georgia Tech. Our side's headed by John Tamanoff is here tonight. Emory, uh, Ned Wallers, 
will be here tomorrow, was here last night, but is not here tonight. And then the University of Georgia, Steve Stice, who is here tonight. And, you know, there's a, there's a wonderful cartoon that I sometimes show. But don't worry, I'm not showing slides tonight. But um, it has this father with his little boy looking at this statue. And the statue shows five people around the table. And the father says to the little boy, you see, my son, there are no great men, only great committees. Well, my paraphrase of that is, there are no great men, only great teams. And we've had a great team in Georgia, and we've benefited from that. Um, there's another quote that I want to give you. Probably many of you fly Delta. In the November magazine, there was a nice interview of Robin Roberts, who's the ABC um, uh, news reporter, commentator. And she was quoted as saying, there are no strangers in this world, only people I have not met yet. While I look at this meeting, Bernie, as one where there are no strangers in this room, only people who have not met yet, and the purpose of this meeting is to provide the opportunity for us all to meet. So I've been fortunate to work with a great team. I feel like this award tonight is really recognition of this team, and I thank all of you. I actually was hoping Bernie was going to have me come up here and tell stories about Gene Loring, but uh, <laughs> Gene, <laughs> he didn't ask me, so the audience was spared. <laughs> but again, thanks everyone. I am truly honored. Thank you. Careful going down the steps, I don't want to get sued. Okay, thank you. <laughs> for our fun, thank you, Bob. Um, and Pete, you know, thank you for that introduction. That was, um, I have to think about that one. Uh, <laughs> it was great. Uh, our final award uh, is a, a recognition that we give every year, an inspiration award, and we've given it to individuals and also uh, given recognition to certain organizations. So this year we're recognizing an, a, a grassroots organization that was started in Atlanta, CureCP. Cerebral palsy is a broad term used to describe a group of chronic palsies, disorders that impair control of movement due to damage to the developing brain. It's a very common cause of chronic childhood disability, as you all know. Through a passionate grassroots advocacy and fundraising initiative, CureCP undertakes and supports forward-thinking research, including current ongoing clinical trials at Duke University School of Medicine and UT Health. It was founded by two wonderful families, the Drambell family and the Dene family, represented tonight by Ed Drambell and Lizette Dene. They're families with children affected by CP. Cure CP and its dedicated volunteers seek a better life and future for children and adults with cerebral palsy. And the fact that they would go to the trouble and effort of raising money for clinical trials and that the, some of the technologies that those in, in this room work, work with, and Joanne Kurtzberg at uh, Duke uh, being one of them, uh, this is just an amazing group. Any of us who have have a family member, a friend, a loved one, or know of anyone with uh, CP, you know, our hearts go out to that community. These are wonderful people and brilliant people, brilliant people, uh, uh, with just an unfortunate affliction. If we can do something to help this community, it's tremendous. Let me recognize uh, uh, Ed and Lisette and the great organization Cure CP. Yours. Wonderful. All right. 
Thank you, Bernie. In 1968, the Olympics were held in Mexico City. There was a marathon runner named John Stephen Akwari. He was from Tanzania. He finished the marathon in last place. He was injured. He limped across the finish line. The sun had set, and there were just a few hundred people left in the Olympic Stadium. When he was asked, why did you keep on going? He answered, my country did not send me 5,000 miles to start a race. They sent me 5,000 miles to finish the race. So he did. Lizette and I are blessed to have two wonderful children named John Dramble and Alex Tanay. They inspired us to begin our long journey, and they're the driving force behind what led us to find or find, found a organization to cure cerebral palsy. Through that, we've been able to achieve things for this community that most people did not think were possible. Countless families like us are affected with cerebral palsy. They have kept us going, and you, the people in this room, you inspire us, you give us hope, and that is what will allow us to finish our race to cure cerebral palsy. Like most new parents, <laughs> like most new parents of medically complex babies, we were overwhelmed and shocked by our children's diagnosis. We were forced to become overnight experts on cerebral palsy make decisions about complex surgeries, and identify and entrust many specialists with the care of our children. It soon became clear that while there, we were fortunate to have access to the basic therapies and emotional support, we weren't hearing anything about how to treat the core problem of CP, how to reverse the neurological damage disrupting our children's developing brains. That's when we started Cure CP. Cure CP advocates for the CP community and funds stem cell research for the millions living with this disability worldwide. The science is out there, here in this room, that can help our children walk, talk, and feed themselves. We are not satisfied with therapies that aim to simply keep them comfortable. We know that with your help, CP can be cured. We are humbled to be surrounded tonight by so many researchers and advocates to the stem cell community. We know we're just scratching the surface on regenerative medicine, and you all are our trailblazers. As parents, we want to say thank you. Our families and others out there with disabilities and fragile medical conditions are counting on all of you. We are grateful to your commitment and perseverance, your long hours and political fights to further science and research, and we appreciate and salute you. It is our great honor to be chosen for tonight's Inspiration Award, especially among all of those here who inspire us daily. Please join us in thanking some people who have supported CureCP in our joint mission. Dr. Joanne Kurtzberg, Dr. Jansen, Dr. Janice Brunstrom Hernandez, Dr. Charles Cox, Dr. Francis Furter, um, Goldman Gives Foundation, and our esteemed board members, our families that have supported us every step of the way. We want to thank, of course, the Genetics Policy Institute, Bernie and Allen, um, for giving this, uh, us this award. CureCP has just started our marathon, but with your help and through the emerging science of regenerative medicine, we believe we can absolutely finish this race and cure the world of cerebral palsy. Thank you so much. Um, I, thank you. Thank you. That was a beautiful talk. It's, it really explains why we're all here. Just as I have you here, I want you to know 
that we have only just begun the World Stem Cell Summit. We have a fantastic Friday starting tomorrow at 8 a.m. where Dr. Joshua Hare of the University of Miami has exciting news to give. We have two keynote sessions uh, from 9 to 10. Please uh, wake up early and you can get, we feed you breakfast before. You're in, gonna be in good shape. I, I, I'll take good care of you. And also after Fantastic Friday, you have Super Saturday. And those of you who are taking an early flight out, change your flight. Because this is the meeting, this is the meeting that will change your life forever. Thank you for joining us for the award ceremony. And have a nice evening.